information technology during the Vietnam War. So before I begin, I first want to give you a perspective on what the aerial combat was to the Vietnam War. So this is a quote from one of the fighter pilots. Where we work is a vicious place. I'll attempt to describe it. But the full comprehension comes along the sky full of hot, hot metal and storm missiles that all seem to be looking at you. You're in a machine that is so fast and powerful that you know that if death comes, it will be full of hot fire. The frail human that you are, you will be shredded to pieces. Worst of all, you'll be alive in a fierce place where your comrades cannot hold you while you die. That is a real fight. That is a real environment of a fighter. So, um, sometimes we, didn't, we tend to think that aerial combat is really, really underrepresented. We tend to think that a grand support unit, you just call an airstrike in, the airplane swoops by, drops a bomb, shoots a missile, and the airplane goes back safely. That is not necessarily the case, especially if you're going to be a known one. So today I wanted to discuss about how the U.S. first aviation tactics. Introduce some of the first design faults for like the first couple of models while also introducing the challenges of the war itself in the environment. However, because of these two factors, the U.S. responded of having improvements to it, um, kind of modify these aircrafts and kind of suit the satisfaction, satisfactory needs for both the pilots and the machinery um, requirements, pretty much. So, requiring an actual war in Vietnam, in 1965, American planes began bombing North Vietnamese targets. The North Vietnamese were heavily defended. They had three main defenses. That was anti-aircraft artillery, also having Migoyen, Singerovich designed fighter jets, was the Soviet supplied um, fighter jets used by the Vietnamese Air Force, while also having a Soviet supplied bombing missile system consisting of Soviet surface to air missiles, pretty much. So, regarding the um, first begins with Operation Rolling Thunder, so that began during Lyndon B. Johnson's presidency. So, in 1965, the first couple of missions were intended to like destroy the main routes. Uh, to prevent kind of like, uh, distribution, trade routes for uh, weapons, men, and supplies from northern, from the northern Vietnamese. However, and we had a really limited success in the first three years. So over 600,000 bombs were actually dropped in Vietnam. In Vietnam, it cost over 300 million dollars in damage. With the cost of the actual, like the actual campaign, cost over 900 million dollars. So they lost over 600 million dollars just for this campaign mission. Limited success. So with the limited success, there was actually one pilot who commented it. Or he said, I think we used every kind of bomb imaginable. In respect to back flights, I remember launching the same plane up to three times in one ship. We were tired and so were the pilots. That was said by Sam Lessons here, who's an F4 Phantom Bridge. So he was even highly criticized by politician, even by Robert McNamara, who's a US Secretary of Defense during Johnson's presidency, where he said, the goddamn Air Force, we're, they're dropping more on North Vietnam than they dropped in Germany in the last year of World War II, and it's not doing anything. So, and I'll be discussing how the U.S. first aviation tactics had sort of design forms. Now, throughout the course of the Vietnam War, there were multiple aircrafts used uh, throughout the course of the war, specifically fighter jets. And I'll be including the A-4 Intruder, the F-105 Thunder Chief, as well as the A-6 uh, Skyhawk, and also the F-100 Super Sub. But today, specifically, I wanted to focus on the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom Model 2. So, some speculations about the aircraft itself. There's a two-seat twin-engine, Fire Interceptor Supersonic Jet. The F-4 had a capability to carry over 8,480 um, kilograms of weapons for on the airfield. It had a supply of eight advanced air-to-air -air missiles with four long, four long range radar guided called the AIM-7 Spurs, and the four range shorter range heat sequence was called the AIM-9 Cyber Spurs. So in its first approach in combat, in 1962, the Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles did not perform up to expectations. They frequently missed our targets and were subject to countermeasures. So beginning you know, like around 1966, uh, there was the combat record showed that less than 45% of the actual missiles actually launched successfully or even locked down at all. So that's almost half of the missiles that are not really successful. So that's a huge problem money-wise and for the fighter pilots if you're up there in the air. So in terms of like the lost American pilots in the first US campaign, the US Navy reported losing three F4 Phantom fighters with eight kills. That's like a three to one ratio. Or a U.S. Air Force was part of losing seven F-4s for 10 kilos. Now, comparing this to the previous war, which is the Korean War, the kill ratio was actually 10 to 1. In the beginning of the Vietnam War, it decreased up to 3 to 1, so that's a 70% decrease in combat, according to the combat records. So, some of the design flaws and the impact for the pilots is that the hot human environment of Vietnam was actually very problematic, and it caused uh, multiple difficulties for both mechanics and the aircraft and the health of the pilots. That included some engine defects, and also heat stress in the cockpits of that form. So regarding like the engine defects, 
So there was a variant called the F4C, and its engines, known as the J79 twin engines, would actually produce like a trail of black smoke during flight. But that's not a very good strategy for trying to avoid um, detection. So it was actually visible up to 25 miles away. The F4C, um, its primary purpose was like ground support unit. But if the ground is surrounded by surface air missiles and anti-aircraft artillery, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be a good day for you. So pretty much an increase for detection by enemy MiGs, which are Soviet MiGs fighters, and then same. So regarding the site of the study peak stress in the cockpits, in 1978, there's actually a study of nine pilots, ages 33 to 41, who have an F4 flying experience. They collected over 36, 36 flights in total, in a variant called the F4C. So the pilots in the study reported to feel uncomfortably warm up throughout the most flights. They had extreme feelings of nausea and fatigue, while with like tunnel emission and from the extreme heat. And any excess speed in the F4C models increased chances of overheating, and the electrical equipment would actually like ooze and melt, so it can cause a like, huge trough like the machine itself. So looking, so the aircraft maximum performance can go up to uh, 1,400 miles per hour. Now, if the pilot wanted to decide to go any other faster, that is a huge interest for the aircraft and for their health. So now that I discussed what about the design flaws, next I'll be discussing about the challenges of the war itself and the environment. So the challenges in Vietnam War, there were two main challenges. Those are the McCoy and Gurevich fighters, which are Soviet-based fighters, and also surface-to-air missiles used by the North, North Vietnamese. So regarding this type of fighter, which is called the MiG-21, abbreviated, it was a, the actual 21 was deadly in, in its strength. It was difficult to acquire visually at any great distance. It was an interceptor fire with Mach 2, which is known as to travel two times faster than the speed of sound. Compared that to the F-4, which is the American aircraft, it goes to only around 1.4 which is around 1.4 times the speed of sound. So it was developed to have higher speeds and maneuverability compared to the Navy's favorite the F-4C. So consisting of the MiG fighters, in 1965, when they were first introduced to the North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese they have been responsible for only 1% of aircraft losses. Not that much, right? However, as the, as the war continued further on, the MiG-21 fighters shot down at 14 of the F-105 energy fighters. The Navy didn't lose any. As the war continued even further in 1968, and it makes them claim 22% of all down U.S. aircraft, that's almost a 22% increase. As for the threat of surface to air missiles, in 1965, most American aircraft like the radar, uh, radar, radar warning systems and radar jamming equipment. So it would make them really difficult to like jam the systems like the surface to air missiles before they even lock on, or even attack them to walls. It's kind of like going to like a war zone, kind of like being blinded. So, as the war continued even further on, between 1967 and 1972, the SAMs had 197 American aircraft in total. Now, in terms of like the human perspective, pilots would actually report how terrifying it is that the SAM, the SAM doesn't come at them at such a high speed. So, for example, one quote by Robin Bolt, who is a U.S. Air Force pilot during the Vietnam War, he said, I'd seen enemy planes before, but those SAM SAMs were something else. When I, saw my when I saw my first one, there were a few seconds of sheer pain. Because that's the most impressive sight to see that thing coming in. You feel like a fish about to be harpooned. There's something terribly personal about the sin. It means to kill you, and I'll tell you right now, it rearranges your priorities. So some of that response is the United States because of these challenges. Is that there have to be a strategic and equipment modification to the current models. There has to be a way to comment these these MiG fighters as well as to comment these sin because they're third not only our aircraft, but our pilots as well. So there are actually three approaches to combat the deadly sins. That's either to evade them, electronically jam them, mislead or disrupt their tracking, it's in the ramp. So the United States first approached uh, this challenge by initiating Operation Ironhead. So in 1966, it was approached to use long-range electronic jamming equipment embedded in aircraft to target on missile and an anti-aircraft artillery radar through missiles. So in the beginning of September 1966, the Air Force actually initiated a jamming system which is called the QRG-161 jamming pod. And it was used in most of aircraft artillery. So in a picture that's actually called the A4 shooter, that's one of the one of the examples of the jamming pod actually embedded in it. And in between, as the war transcended between April 25th and 29th of that same year, the United States Air Force aircraft hit and always rail, rail yards, electronic transformers, stations, and one of the city bridges. Because of the use of this kind of machinery, it actually made it more easier for a more strategic approach. Before, uh, most aircrafts, when they're about to do like a bombing run, they come like a formation, kind of like a, you know, when you see seals in here, they come like a, kind of like a, kind of like a triangle without the third side, so kind of like that kind of formation. But if you have sand turrets firing at you, that kind of formation doesn't work. You have to turn immediately and have to evade the missile as soon as possible. 
Well, with Dexity's uh, jamming pause, it made it a lot easier to um, introduce that method without having the possibility to be like disrupting the formation. So, lessons learned from the US campaign in Vietnam. So, pretty much the main priority is about pilot safety. Like, you can put as many missiles and weapons as you can in a fighter jet, but the main priority is you need to find a pilot who can actually use it to its full advantage. So, as much as much weaponry as you can put, it's more about just putting how many missiles you can put in, how much weaponry. It's how the pilot can actually get comfortable with the upgrades and see how can you use it to its maximum potential. So, the most importantly at all learned from the Vietnam is to reduce the cost of fault to design variables. So, for example, when I talk about the F4, I had like five different variants. Each one was like an improvement upon the previous one. And that costs a lot of money, so there has, really doesn't have to be so many rates in the first place. The, the considerations were, you know, inspected more carefully in the first place. And also important a lot is to reduce and prevent further losses of both the aircraft and American planes. It's not just about the war machines, it's about who's actually flying them. Those are American people who are flying in these aircrafts. So as for the American pilots today, there's been a, so basically the Vietnam War like a huge foundation because it was basically like a trial and error approach, and the Vietnam War was a disaster disastrous for the American pilots. So the U.S. approach said that there has to be an improvement to both communication systems, the fuselage of the aircraft, as well as more communication to like what the actual pilots is saying about it. Better than just like putting a whole bunch of machinery on it and saying, there you go, fly off and do a bombing run. So for example, there's uh, John Venable, who's a senior research fellow for the defense policy in the retired U.S. Air Force Thunderbird Commander. He said, pilots drive in situational awareness. So as a pilot, if you can make it simple for me to detect an enemy, that's great. If you can make it simple for me to see the enemy, that's even better. So, in conclusion, what the board basically tells us is that there has to be high, higher inspections for these types of models. You cannot just simply just upgrade it at a consistent rate. We first have to realize how much, what are requirements. So for example, in Vietnam War, there were multiple challenges and we weren't ready for it. The North Vietnamese were a lot more prepared for um, in terms of like aerial defense and um, enemy fighters. So in modern times where we have much more expensive projects, this is that F-35 Joint Striker Fighter number two. This one airplane costs around over $100 million. In the program itself in 2018, it's uh, estimated to cost over $1 trillion. So comparing that to the cost of like being used aircraft, it's important to realize there has to be a lot that the inspection levels for these types of aircraft has to be its maximum potential. For so right now, we're just trying to reduce as many um, many losses that the aircraft in our pilots. It's important to reconsider these um, kind of considerations, especially when we're uh, trying to combat as many uh, spectrum of conflicts today, especially the warfare that's undertaking today in the Middle East. Thank you. States uh, was so were there like really major weapon like large weaponry differences on those planes and did that affect the combat at all that give an advantage to one side or the other? So for the beginning models with the F4, the link is just still like um, heat seeking missiles. Mm -hmm. While the MiG fighters had heat seeking missiles and cannons, like an actual gun cannon. So American pilots reported it was a huge problem that we try to do like dog fighting. Mm -hmm. If they had a missile, you have to wait. You have to wait for the missile to lock on. And that's a huge. That's like a huge time delay. Whereas you have like a gun cannon, you can just fire immediately, and all you need to rely on is just accuracy. So in the beginning of the war, uh, the big fighters used by North, the North Vietnamese had a huge, had a bigger advantage, pretty much, compared to the Americans. So that's what produced the latest version of the F4, which is the E variant, with, uh, which eventually had the gun cannon as well. Because you learn from it that you need both a missile and a gun cannon to be successful in very well. Yeah. Um, so, you said that the Sidewinder missile and the radar one were very effective, right? What, was that the pilot error or was that the system itself? It's mostly mechanical errors. So, like, the biggest approach is towards the Vietnam is just how much we can put on the aircraft and just send it off. So, it was actually more technical and much more component than enough pilots. So, the pilots were playing, you know, oh, I have a perfect, you know, perfect um, position to fire this missile. And the, and the screen says, oh, here. So, that's a huge problem. So, it's more mostly electrical than mechanical. Kind of sloppy mechanic, or sloppy mechanic. Yeah, they're just so obsessed with like how much we can put on it. Just yeah. so that was the biggest mistake. Yes. So yeah, the scope of your presentation, which was fascinating. So really good job on that. I'm just curious. 
does the introduction of militarized drones uh, eventually render this kind of traditional uh, fighter pilot warfare obsolete? Uh, or are they still serving very different purposes? Have you looked into kind of the effects of the new technologies becoming so much more accurate? So the, well, one of the biggest approaches about stealth technology, so they're in the court to the same word in this because somebody's going to be regret. With the worst stealth aircraft, that we use like in higher atmospheres, and also like a huge jump to like detect enemies without using like fighter aircraft like the lower altitudes. Yeah. So that kind of inspired the UAV drones that we have today, using our military to the Predator and so on. So yeah. the first kind of they were first used in Vietnam, and they're really successful. So for example, there's the, SO, the SR-71 Blackbird. That aircraft was never shot down by enemy forces. There was only like around like 100 produced, and none of them were actually shot down. Now they like a huge foundation of developing you know higher tech. Technology. They can go to low, both lower altitudes and higher altitudes. So, yeah. so we're going to see more drones and fewer manned aircraft. Definitely. Just the biggest issue right now is uh, pilot safety. So if you just create a drone, then you really don't have to worry about, you know, an American live being lost. It's just about the money. So it's like, not just like a, a huge business opportunity, like for engineers and software engineers, but also reducing losses. losses for